Pablo Picasso has been nominated by some as the greatest artist of the 20th century. This claim, however, can seem a little hard to believe for some people when they actually see his work. Picasso's canvases, full of gurning, dripping and misshapen figures with their nightmarish colour palettes and creative facial feature placements, don't look much like the great artworks of old we're used to. And yet, Picasso was again and again held up as being the greatest artist of the 20th century. Why? What exactly was the reason for his supposed greatness, and just what is the deal with all those faces? Well, in this video we're going to take a little look at those questions, and try to understand a little better the hows and whys of Picasso. Pablo Picasso, just in case you didn't know, was a Spanish painter, sculptor, ceramicist, printmaker, poet and practitioner of just about any other art form you would care to mention. Born in 1881, the infant Picasso almost didn't survive his own birth. When he was delivered, the nurses found he was limp and silent. The midwife declared a stillbirth, but the young Picasso was saved by his uncle, who gently took the newborn in his arms and promptly blew cigar smoke into his face, which caused the infant Picasso to begin to stir and cry. The young Picasso, having survived his birth, began from an early age to show his inclinations towards painting. His father, who was an art teacher, may have had something to do with this. From the age of seven, he trained Picasso in the academic style, and it was not long before his son had soon surpassed him in the technical matters. Picasso's early paintings show his enormous skill and talent, as we can see in this early work showing his family a communion, a religious scene which would both please his father and prove his skills. Following the family's relocation to Barcelona, Picasso applied to attend the School of Fine Arts, a prestigious school for artists. Picasso's father managed to convince the school's examiners to allow his son to take the entrance exams, a process which usually took a whole month but which Picasso completed in just one week. An impressive feat that is made more impressive by the fact that he was just 13 at the time. The School of Fine Art, however, was not the place where he would make his name. He quickly tired of the instructors and their stifling traditions and methods. Just like all art students, he soon began skipping classes, drinking cans, and hanging around with bohemian intellectual types. From these influences and the academy's lack of innovation, Picasso decided that the traditional route of academic painting was not for him. If he wanted to produce great art, he would have to look outside of the traditional art school approaches. To this end, he would head to the capital of the art world, Paris where the cutting-edge painters of the day, such as Cezanne, Gauguin, and the Impressionists, had made their names, making art that the fine art schools of the day probably would not like. During Picasso's time in Paris, he was, as is not uncommon for many artists, disgustingly poor. He shared a small flat with a friend, and supposedly would often have to burn his works just to keep the place warm. Living in such circumstances did, however, give him the opportunity to meet many of the intellectual and artistic elite of Paris, namely people like Henri Matisse or the poet Apollinaire, who fed his ideas and influenced his development. It is perhaps because of these influences that we start to see the Picasso we know today emerging, characterised by his famous blue and rose periods. Picasso's work in these periods becomes much more modern than his previous art school efforts and begins to break away from the traditional methods in noticeable ways, including limited palettes of colour, non-traditional subjects, and an often scandalous disregard for proper painting practice. These unusual and evocative paintings, with their deft handling of figures and expressive content, soon attracted the attention of the Parisian art world, including wealthy art dealers such as Leo and Gertrude Steen, whose support would prove crucial. They were not the only ones interested either, Ambrose Vallard, the art dealer who had championed Paul Cézanne, offered his support, perhaps seeing in Picasso's emerging modern style a continuation of Cézanne's work. Cézanne's posthumous show in 1907 had solidified his role as a major influence on all modern art, and created a lot of interest in finding new ways of painting, as Cézanne himself had done. Cézanne would be a major influence on Picasso's work, but there was another influence that would play just as big a role, but come from a much more unexpected place. In 1907, Picasso saw the collection of African tribal masks on display in the Musée d'Ihon. These relics had been brought back from the colonies in Africa and stuffed into museums, which to this day remains a great way to get away with otherwise criminal theft. The masks, to Picasso, exuded an almost spiritual energy. Their simple forms and rough craftsmanship seemed somehow purer and more direct as artworks than their overly formal counterparts in the art schools and galleries of his day, 
To Picasso, they represented a simpler, more direct, and more effective way of expressing an idea. These masks eventually began to find their way into Picasso's paintings. It was inspiration from another time and place, giving a viewpoint from another perspective. Alongside the works of artists like Cezanne, these masks would play a crucial role in the development of Picasso's ideas, and this can best be seen in what is probably the first great masterpiece of the 20th century, Le Demoiselles d'Avignon. Le Demoiselles d'Avignon is an image you could describe charitably as horrifying, even to us today who are so used to images both real and created of unbridled horror. The painting, which depicts the accusatory stares of a group of female brothel workers, was so controversial that it sat facing the wall in Picasso's studio for years. Everyone who saw it was repulsed. Even Picasso himself thought he had gone too far. And yet this painting would eventually end up being seen as one of the most important paintings of the 20th century, despite its gruesome appearance. The title, Le Demoiselles d'Avignon, or roughly, The Women of Avignon, refers to a street famed for prostitution in Barcelona. Its main subject, the female nude, is itself not unusual, having been a perennially popular subject for artists practically forever. The hardened, art-going public of Picasso's day would have been well used to seeing a few bare arses in paintings, but Demoiselles was unlike anything they had ever seen. Unlike the nudes of the past, these figures do not recline in surrender or shy away demurely. Instead, they starkly cut across the canvas and stare coldly back at us. This confrontational tone is enhanced by the handling of the paint, which in its day was tantamount to barbarism. The reds, pinks and blue tones of the canvas create a disjointed, unnatural colour scheme which evokes flesh, mystery and danger. The figures themselves occupy a broken, flattened space where hints of drapery and a suspiciously placed bowl of perhaps forbidden fruit are discernible, but not much else. The figure on the left seems to invite us into the scene, drawing back at a curtain made of part of the background itself. The contorted faces scowl at the viewer from this patchwork wall, as if to deny them the pleasure that a viewer would normally expect from a painting. The whole thing howls in a way that pictures really hadn't before, and expresses a rawness that was inconceivable of anything else that had come before it. This rawness is the reason for the picture's impact. These figures may look simple compared to the technical masterworks other artists had created before, but none of those works could approach the sheer screaming agony that every fibre of Demoiselles d'Avignon evokes. At a very base level, it depicts the fear of disease that prostitution could bring, as well as the allure of such encounters, which would draw many to them regardless. This was a fear known all too well in Picasso's day, and especially in the circles he ran in. In Demoiselles, Picasso explores this fear and in doing so, points to a new possibility for painting. There are some interesting facts about Picasso's planning of this composition, which can help us to further understand both how different this work is from previous paintings, as well as just what it is this painting is doing to affect us. First, we know from his initial sketches that Picasso had originally included two other figures, a sailor and a medical student. Both intended to be patrons of the brothel, as well as memento moris, reminders of death which served as a warning about the dangers of such dalliances. This would have been a fairly traditional addition to a painting, one which would allow the viewer to project themselves onto the character and understand the context of the scene through their eyes. In this case, as a sailor eager to visit the brothel after months at sea, and a medical student who is all too aware of the risks. Somewhere along the line, however, Picasso removed these two figures and left the audience to face the brunt of the women's confrontational stare ourselves. The second choice that Picasso made was to paint each figure in a different style and perspective, making them deliberately incongruent with each other. This is where the influence of those African tribal masks comes into play, as well as Zan, Iberian sculptures, the work of El Greco, and many, many others, which can all be pointed to as influences. These multiple points of inspiration would further fracture the figure's styles. This gives each of the figures a sense of identity that is not only unique, but independent from the others. 
these decisions do something very interesting to our perceptions of the painting. For one thing, it stops us and makes us look and wonder why. It then makes us realize that the space of the image is flatter than we might first assume, which puts us closer to the figures than we initially think we are. Finally, by removing any sort of extraneous characters from the scene, which we might otherwise project our view onto, Picasso has made us, the viewer, the uncomfortable subject of the women's accusatory gaze. These are somewhat experimental choices, which had their detractors at the time, but Picasso was onto something. Perhaps painting could achieve something beyond just representing the world around it. By breaking away from the need to represent, the language of painting could be freed up to be used in different and sometimes shocking ways. Le Demoiselles d'Avignon would eventually come to be regarded as one of the most important paintings of the 20th century, but you wouldn't know it by the reaction it got. Most of Picasso's friends who saw the work were disgusted or bemused by its unsightly appearance. Henri Matisse, who in those days was Picasso's arch rival, actually regarded the work as being a kind of insane false flag attack on the fledgling modern art movement, designed to rob it of all credibility. Be that as it may, not all of Picasso's friends turned their noses up at the Demoiselles. One in particular, George Brack, would see something in it that he had been looking for, a new way of painting. In the following years, Picasso and Brack would work together to create this new way of painting based on what Picasso had done in Demoiselles. Brack described their relationship as being like two mountaineers roped together, each hoping the other would not fall. Picasso described it as like being married. I'm not sure which sounds scarier, falling off a mountain or being married to Picasso, but their working relationship would eventually bear artistic fruit in the century-defining movement that is Cubism. Cubism, as a method, goes something like this. Cubist artworks take their subjects, break them down according to their planes and shapes, and lay them out for us to see from many angles, all at once. In this manner, we can see the subject from the front, side, top, bottom, or even from moment to moment, all at once, perceiving a totality of its form in a way that traditional paintings could never depict. This means that in Cubism, there's no need to represent naturalistically, since we are viewing our subjects from an already impossible position. This is the essence of Cubism. When you look at a cubist painting, it can often seem to be just a bunch of squares and angles overlapping, with suspiciously few cubes. But when the realisation that we are seeing from multiple angles is made, it quickly becomes apparent what these images are conveying. Common still life subjects, a figure playing guitar or descending a staircase. Multiple frames of perceived existence layered over each other. The cubists took traditional subject matter and turned our view of it on its head. This was inspired by what Picasso had wrought in Demoiselles, but it also came from the many changes that had taken place in society at the time as modernization took hold. In those days, at the start of the 20th century, seeing the world from different viewpoints was becoming a common occurrence. With the advent of, well, just about everything, the world seemed like it was shrinking in some ways and expanding in others. This changing pace of life made it seem like traditional painting was not quite up to the task of capturing modern life. Even if that was what you wanted to do, a photograph would probably have been the better option, or at least faster. Painting was still seen as a medium suited to painting romantic scenes, historical depictions, or portraits of horses for rich people, rather than a method suited to responding to the modern world. After all, what could a painting show that a camera could not capture? When Picasso and Brack begun their development of Cubism, they were driven by these questions. They saw the changing world around them, and the ineffectiveness of traditional painting methods to respond to it. They noticed the role of the artwork changing as mass production came into effect, and the impact of ideas from outside the Western canon of art seeping in. They saw the need for a new form of painterly expression, and from that, Cubism emerged. Something interesting to note regarding Cubism is its subject matter in relation to its position as a very modern way of painting. Despite its reputation as a very cutting-edge, avant-garde sort of painting style, its subjects were traditionally typical ones. Still lives, figures, balls of fruit, household objects, 
the kind of stuff you'd expect from a more traditional painting, rather than the insanity of modern art. This may have been because, despite Picasso and Braque's need for the new, there was still a deeply held connection to the old. The mode of delivery may have been changing, but not the essence of wishing to convey a view of the world. It was just that now there were many views, rather than one. The Cubist movement, started by Picasso and Braque, would go on long after their involvement had ended. It branched out into analytic and synthetic variants, which would become a whole lot more complicated and foreshadow the full abstraction that was to come in the 20th century. For Picasso, however, the damage had been done, so to speak. He was now famed for his extraordinary paintings and was world-renowned as the face of Cubism and father of modern painting. From here on out, Picasso was to become something of a superstar, a household name that could stand for everything from the forward-thinking modern era to the debasement of the previously uncorrupted art of painting. His reputation and his myth would be built on the impact of Cubism, and propel him forwards into a career which would stretch across two world wars and into a cold one, defining the century as the era of modern art and Picasso as its poster boy. All of this does not answer our question, however. Was Picasso the greatest artist of the 20th century? Well, I mean, he wasn't the worst anyway. But to answer the question properly, we're going to have to continue on in part two, where we'll discuss the later portions of his life, his fame, celebrity, and politics, and finally answer the question of his purported greatness. So I hope you'll join me then, thank you very much for listening, and if you have any questions or comments, please stick them down below. <laughs>